Okay, my clock shows it's nine o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Derek Ramsey. I will be moderating the session. Um, the session this morning is Let's Create Inclusive Course Content. Uh, the presenters are going to be Tiffany Stahl. Tiffany is a UVA Collab User Support Specialist at the University of Virginia and the chair of the Sakai Accessibility Working Group. Professional interests include accessibility, help documentation, and Semigo testing quizzes. Uh, we also have presenting in this session, Jen Bethman. She is the Web Accessibility Coordinator for Illinois State University. She serves as the Campus Resource for Web and Application Accessibility and Usability Standards and Best Practices. She is certified as a trusted tester from the Office of Accessible Systems and Technology with the Department of Homeland Security and Adobe's PDF Accessibility Train the Trainer certification. Um, as we're going through the session, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to post them in chat. I'll do the best I can to keep up with them and uh, let um, Tiffany and Jen know as they come in. Um, other than that, uh, you guys can go ahead and get started. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the introduction. Um, Tiffany, I, I kind of stopped. We are going to probably turn off our cameras uh, during the session just so we can focus on the, the content. Uh, yep. But yes, I'm, I'm Jen Bethman. I'm from Illinois State University. Uh, a lot of times where inclusive course content is very close to my heart. Um, and a lot of the things that we're going to try to share with you actually can span beyond just your course content. So it's something to think about in documents and web pages anything that you create in a digital environment. So mm -hmm. ready to get started. Is yep. there anything you want to mention, Tiffany, first? Um, we are, um, we do have a website. I don't know if, Jen, did you okay. paste that in the chat recently? I did, and I hadn't gotten okay. that message yet. <laughs> Great. OK, uh -huh. so um, we, um, we've, rather than creating slides, uh, we've created uh, Sakai uh, lesson page, uh, lessons pages, I guess I should say, with the content mm -hmm. for this uh, presentation with some links because we're going to be talking about uh, doing that in your courses, uh, creating your own uh, lessons. All right, thank you. Let us get started. So our, as we said, let's create inclusive content. As an educator, we, you're both curator and creator of course content. Uh, you are trying to pass your knowledge on to your students or other colleagues and being able to use Sakai, we're looking to follow some common universal design practices to help you ensure that your students and anybody who is reading your content has access to it. Nobody is blocked from the information uh, inadvertently. And this is basically, we wanna make sure everybody, regardless of ability or disabilities, has this positive learning experience throughout. Uh, one of the things we will do today is talk a lot more about the how and not always about the why, we do encourage you to uh, go to the session after this for Terry Golightly. Uh, she's doing making your own or your course user friendly for everyone. She will also probably talk about a lot of the why. So we mentioned with, uh, we worked with Terry and we were trying not to cross the information so much. So hopefully being able to attend both these sessions will give you a robust information on what to do to make your courses as inclusive and user friendly as possible. Um, you are welcome to follow along with your own instances of Sakai as well if you want to open up a, a lessons page and follow along with the instructions. Otherwise, you can also sit and listen to us. Uh, today's agenda, we have a lot to fit in in about 50 minutes. What we're going to do today is set forth uh, talking about getting good content. And then we will talk about how to add that content into Sakai via the resources tool. And we will then uh, move on to talking about building your lesson pages in order to present your content. And we're ready to go. You want to move to the get good content? Thank you, Tiffany. Getting good content. This is the first step. And in order for having a, a truly universally designed course, it is starting with your curation. It is where you go and find your documents. You find your articles, your videos, podcasts, images, everything comes together as you're trying to curate this content in order to present your lessons to your students. This, a lot of times as we go forward, your potential resources can be your library, uh, talking to subject librarians, going through and finding your information there. 
instructional designers, if you are lucky to have one of those on campus, uh, those can be very helpful in creating uh, and helping you curate good, accessible, and usable content. Also, we want to encourage you to touch base with your disability resources. Even if you do not have a student who requires an accommodation, talk to your disability resources office, get a meeting to go together with them, ask them how they would suggest uh, updating your content. So they have a lot of hands-on knowledge on what students need when it comes to accessible course content. Now, many times when we talk about getting that good content, uh, we talk about accessible documents and then media. And on this page, we're actually going to talk uh, more specifically about documents and videos. We'll mention uh, images a little bit later when it comes to creating the lesson page. But accessible documents, those articles that your students are reading uh, every day in class, becomes very important for getting the information across. What we encourage you is to avoid scanned image PDFs. This is when you go and you scan the PDF into a file and all it does is take a picture of the document. Uh, Tiffany has just opened up a Adobe uh, a PDF. What she is trying to do is her mouse is actually being dragged across. She's trying to select text. This is a way that you can go and check your articles. Uh, if you open up a PDF, whether it's in a web browser or Adobe or whatever your PDF viewer, try to select individual characters in a word. So if you try to select creating multicultural, at this point, this is an image only. This is just a photograph. None of the characters are able to be read. And what is important is no, a, a machine is not going to be able to recognize that these are words. It's just going to be a blank image. Um, particularly when it comes to assistive technologies, such as text-to-speech readers or screen readers, this information is not going to be available to your students. What you can do is, in many cases, um, working with Adobe Acrobat Pro DC, you're able to create some or a readable PDF. Some scanners have the ability to have an optical character recognition that is an OCR, and they are able to create documents that what we call readable. Now this is just making sure the text is available to be read by another machine. And this will improve some of the experiences for uh, assistive technologies. But I do want to caution you that this is not would not be considered a fully accessible document because it is not tagged. Now tagged documents is another hour to two hour conversation. Uh, but what we want to encourage you as a step in a positive direction, go and uh, take a look at your courses and do this test. Check out to see if your documents are readable and then work with maybe your libra library, talk to your disability resources and see how or what options you have on your campus to make sure that your documents and articles are readable. We also want to encourage you that any documents that are created maybe in Word or Google Docs, these are documents that also can have a underlying structure, which we will mention later during the lessons page. Within the lessons page, a lot of what we talk about in terms of structure and uh, alt text for images, that is, can again span to digital documents, it can span to other types of web pages. So what we talk about now can spread across any of your digital mediums. Um, we're not gonna open up the Word document, but you are welcome to use this as a resource. It basically reiterates a lot of the information, but more specific to Microsoft Word. Uh, moving on to the next topic that we have, does anyone have any questions about documents or anything? Uh, Google Docs can also change an image uh, it is not perfect, but it, yes, it does essentially. Most things now with the with COVID, there is a lot of pushing for uh, a lot of the document things or scans to happen. Uh, that has become in the last couple of years, but thank you for sharing the, the Google Docs. Um, videos. Videos can also uh, provide a barrier at times. When choosing your videos, it is very important to make sure that they have accurate captions. Um, we often talk about captions at the moment. Uh, this could help somebody who might be a second language learner 
This could be an individual who uh, is deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, I once had a student worker who had a processing disorder and she needed captions to understand what is being told in all her course videos. Um, one of the things as we talk about is when it comes to finding these videos, again, go to your subject library librarians for help. They can um, often help and do searches. Uh, if you are then choosing videos yourself, maybe through YouTube or Google, uh, Tiffany, if you wanna go to YouTube, our YouTube example, YouTube is really easy. If you type in your search keyword and then put comma CC at the end, uh, Tiffany has already done this for us and done wonderful. If you look at the videos that are available, you'll see in brackets, uh, bracket CC. And that is going to tell you that somebody has created a closed caption file already. This is not auto-generated. This is somebody has taken the time to put a closed caption file onto the video. Now, I do want to say YouTube's auto-generated. The AI uh, captions have gotten infinitely better over the years, but there is still a high potential of inaccurate content and not all the time can you go in and change that inaccurate content. So if you go in and do your searches with looking for closed caption videos first, then you have a better um, chance of making sure that your video is universally designed. Another thing you could do with Google searches, Google has actually a Google advanced video search. And this is a page, the link is in our, uh, our Sakai site. And if you select the um, subtitles option at the bottom and select closed captioned only, again, type in your keywords up at the top, you will be able to curate and find videos that only have closed captions. So this will help you curate your videos and already start, especially when you're looking for those videos like the night before a class because you're wanting current relation or current, uh, current politics, current relations, anything that's going on um, and needs to talk about it the next day in class, this is a good way to try. So that way you're able to just do your searches and make sure there's closed captions. Many times the same thing also, um, it's not here on the thing, but I do want to kind of plug if you do do like podcasts or anything, adding like a transcript and looking for those podcasts that have transcripts, those would be very helpful as well. Uh, just making sure that there's an alternative method. Uh, the image or video we have here is just an example video um, of an instructor introduction. We call this class SAS 101. Uh, but the in, lady in who is doing this is Winnie. She's from Nairobi. Uh, so we talk about how important it is that closed captions are there in order to make sure it is very, um, the original time the AI did was misspelled Winnie's name, didn't uh, a couple of times, a couple of sentences were off that made the entire uh, speech a little confusing. So we went in and updated it and made sure that the closed captions were accurate. And so now I'm going to pass this off to Tiffany, because once we've curated our content, we need to get the content into Sakai. And Tiffany is going to talk about getting the content into Sakai. Thank you, uh, Jen. So uh, I know that uh, we're, we're going to go into lessons, but I know that some folks may not be comfortable with lessons yet. Um, and you may just want to put your content in resources. So we're actually going to talk about putting content in resources first. And we're going to have a lot of things that kind of overlap through the different things we're talking about um, or the different topics we're talking about. Um, so one of the principles I'm going to be going through in resources here is um, making your links accessible. And we will get back to that as well for the lessons. Um, so when you've uploaded, a, when you're going to upload a file to resources, you want to follow good naming conventions uh, and try to make that file name uh, as, as you know, reasonably descriptive as possible, but also very short. Try to keep your file names and folder names as short as possible. Um, and also avoid using special characters um, like, you know, ampersands and things like that if you can. Um, certain computers uh, don't handle those very well. 
And um, so you want to try to stick to letters, numbers, dashes, and underscores. And, um, and here I have a video with audio desk captions.jpg. This is an image. Um, and so what I want to do here is make this link so it doesn't look like the file name uh, friendlier for my students. So to do that in resources, I'm going to select actions and edit details. And in here you have uh, what's called a display name. And this can be different from your file name. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy in here um, a display name that I have written, um, which is screenshot of a video with audio description, because that's exactly what this uh, file is. So telling people exactly what they're going to get to uh, when they click on your link. Um, so I come down here and uh, I select update. And now uh, my resources says that I have here a screenshot of a video with audio description. So when a student clicks on this and encounters this, this screenshot, um, that's exactly what they're going to, to find. Now, another thing uh, for creating links and resources is um, that you may want to add a link, a web link. So here, when I go to actions um, to add content to resources, one of my options is adding web links URLs, and I'm going to select that. And in here, I enter a web address. So I'm just going to put in uh, oed.com here. And you can see that the address automatically populates also to the website name. And when someone's using a screen reader or text to speech or something like that um, to access a page, they're going to hear this entire link read out http colon slash slash www.oed.com. It doesn't sound very nice. And then this can get especially bad if you have like a really long link, uh, including, you know, random characters like your Sakai sites have, or, um, you know, an article link, for example. So I'm going to change this to Oxford English Dictionary uh, so that students know what they're going to get to when they click on this link. And again, I'm going to go down here and add web links now. So this is for anyone who's afraid to go uh, into lessons because uh, that's new and, and a big, scary tool to, to work with. Um, you can start to do some of these universal design, um, put universal design practices into practice in your resources as well. So let me go on to our back to our lessons here. And uh, our next step is going to be building your lesson page. So I'm going to let uh, Jen start us off here uh, with some basic considerations. All right. Thank you. No, it's always helpful to know uh, ways you can put stuff into Sakai and make sure it is a good user experience. Uh, when it comes to building then your lesson page, so we're ready to get everything together. Studies have and focus groups have shown that the biggest problem with learning management systems like Sakai is often how instructors use them, or more importantly, how they don't use them. Uh, we have a, the example of here is from the uh, ECR uh, studies of technology needs with students with disabilities from 2020. Uh, using lessons is a great way to guide your students through activities so they can get the most out of your course content. So we often encourage, we do encourage you to use the lesson pages in order to present your content to students. Now we have some basic considerations that we want to suggest to you uh, and encourage you to try with your next, the next time you create a lesson page. Make sure to write clear and concise instructions. Uh, we've often come across where instructions can get long and laborious and then, then once the student is trying to turn in an assignment, it might be very confusing. Are we turning in the assignment into resources or are we are turning it into the assignments tab? Is it a test and quiz? So making sure that those instructions are concise on knowing exactly where it is. Uh, also, a lot of times while you're doing your lesson page, those meaningful links become very helpful with making con uh, concise instructions. Uh, make your navigation as simple as possible. We kind of talk, we'll talk later about maybe hiding uh, some unused uh, options. If you take a look on the screen, uh, content analysis assignment, roster, statistics, the site settings, are all actually hidden to students. You can see it as an instructor on the admin side, 
but a student will only see discussions, uh, tests and quizzes, assignments and resources and help uh, and the lesson pages. So it kind of gives it an idea of there's a clear view of where the students need to go and they might, will not get lost in other tools. Uh, choose uh, text and background colors that have high contrast. We'll talk uh, hopefully a little bit about this uh, in more depth later, uh, but making sure that there's really good contrast between your typical is going to be your uh, black text over a white background or a cream background. But in this case, if you do need to want to add color, making sure there's good contrast. And then also including text alternatives for images. These become very important as we're going forward to make sure that there isn't a barrier to any of the information your images are providing your students. Tiffany, right. uh, you wanna go on and talk about instructions? Yeah. Yeah, so instructions, um, it's important to uh, guide your students well. Uh, I know that uh, sometimes you may have students uh, writing in their evaluations that they've spent many hours uh, preparing for class outside of class. You don't want some of that class uh, outside of class time to be spent trying to figure out what to do and where to do it. Um, so if you've ever heard of the KISS design principle, keep it simple, stupid, um, it's a good uh, principle to apply to your um, instructions. And this is in any tool, uh, your assignments, your quizzes, uh, lessons. Um, use short sentences if possible. Arrange everything in logical order. Um, putting the most important uh, item in the beginning of your sentence and uh, saying one thing in each sentence. And then avoiding directional locations only so it may be helpful to say, uh, you know, select resources in the tool menu on the left, but make sure you include the, um, the name of that link or um, something like that so that students who um, may be using a mobile device where things are laid out differently or um, assistive technology can still find the link. Good, how are you doing? Fantastic. Um, How's your can somebody feeling? mute? Great themselves. If that no catch, I'm, I'm no for it. Give me okay. range of motion. Thanks. That is beautiful. So um thanks. Yep. So, so um with uh, the instructions, we also want to improve navigation. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, creating links uh, next. So um, one thing we want to do is link to the activities uh, in our lessons. So I'm gonna go up uh, here to, well, I'm actually gonna go here to this little plus sign. So you see, um, you can add a new item in a section of a lessons page. You can also add content uh, to the bottom of the page if you go to the top and you select that add content link. Um, but so I can keep it uh, in, in this location, I'm going to uh, select this little plus sign here and you see, I have a number of things I can link to. So I'm gonna to link to an assignment. And here I have a week one assignment. So I'm gonna use that selected item. And uh, now I have the link right here um, in my, my lesson page. And maybe I wanna make this link um, a little bit uh, more friendly for students so they know exactly what they're gonna to get to. Uh, week one assignment is pretty decent, but uh, I might want to make that a little bit clearer. Um, and I'm actually going to change this link text here, uh, but we'll talk about links also again in a moment. Uh, so to the right of this uh, link, I have this little edit option. It's a pencil and paper icon. Uh, so I can edit this link. And maybe I'll change this item name to um, submit reaction paper one learning about accessibility so that it's really clear uh, what the students are going to be submitting and they know what's going on. Uh, and I'm gonna select update item here and that will uh, change the link text to make it uh, clearer to students um, what activity they're going to be doing. So now that I've got my assignment linked here, I no longer need assignments in the tool menu. And I'm gonna hide this from students. So you can see there are a number of tools as Jen mentioned that have this little eyeball hidden from site members icon here in the um, tool menu. And if I go to site info uh, at, at UVA, we call it site settings. Um, 
I can uh, go to tool order and that will allow me to hide tools from students. So in tool order, I see my list of tools here. And to the right of each tool is a little cog options icon. So I can uh, select that for assignments and then make tool invisible to students. And I'm actually gonna do that for resources as well. And I'll show you my messy resources in a second. Um, so that students aren't uh, confused when they're looking for a document, they're not gonna go get lost uh, over there in resources. And I'm not gonna use discussions actually in this course. And you may have some tools in your site uh, that came along from a site template, for example, or that were automatically added. If you're not gonna use them, get rid of them. So I'm gonna select this little uh, options cog here and just delete this tool, get rid of discussions. And then it's gonna ask me to confirm and I'm gonna say, okay. Um, and when I'm done uh, making these changes, I need to go down here and select save to uh, make sure that everything is saved. And so now you see there's a whole bunch of little um, eyeballs with slashes over here. Uh, and if I view the site as a student, uh, from the view site as dropdown. Now I can see that all students are encountering here um, is uh, the welcome page, our overview, um, the lessons, uh, building your course, and tests and quizzes. Uh, tests and quizzes does need to be visible to students for any kind of feedback you want to offer them in that tool. So I'm going to exit the student view to get back to my instructor view. And um, Go back to the building the lesson page. So now we've talked about um, navigation and uh, let's go on to link text. We did talk about making link text clear and concise uh, with resources. And um, there are some link text don'ts <laughs> because when you're on a lesson page, you are putting links in context. And so very often we'll think about our links in context as uh, here click here, link, this, or article. I've seen this done in many, many sites um, where instructors say, you know, go to the assignment here, and here is the link. Um, you don't wanna do that because some students are navigating um, with assistive technology by going from link to link on the page uh, using the tab key on their keyboard. And all they're gonna hear is here, 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 don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, try to keep, keep your link text uh, making sense out of context. So if all you hear is that link, uh, submit assignment one, visit, uh, you know, maybe the name of the article, understanding assistive technology, how do deaf blind people use technology, um, include uh, information about the type of thing you're going to link to. So like blog, learn things I learned by pretending to be blind for a week. Uh, intro to an accessible document with word in brackets or parentheses to know that that is a word document they're going to be opening. Um, or a video. It's especially good to put videos uh, in the link text. Uh, so like Michael Nesmith, why we need universal design video in, in parentheses or brackets. Um, and that's really helpful because if somebody's on a device where videos play automatically, especially a mobile device, you don't want to have that video start playing and their audio is, is really uh, loud. So then a couple other link text uh, don'ts uh, for our bad examples. We don't wanna put the entire URL of the link, um, especially if it's like resources or a, a file that was downloaded from an online journal and has this massive long bibliographic entry name. Um, and then the other thing is uh, sort of nebulous uh, links. So here's an example, Granger Article 6, where the instructor had a number of uh, articles written by this author, and they just kind of numbered them instead of putting the titles. So for the students, it was hard for them to find the right one uh, when they needed to get to it. So now let's move on to structure. And some of this, uh, we could have talked about earlier as well. Uh, you wanna structure your page uh, in lessons um, with things like headings. Um, headings are actually not just uh, large text. So when you add a heading to some text, it yes, it makes it sort of large and bold, 
But students using assistive technology, especially screen readers, um, really need heading structure added to the page. And I'll show you how to add them in a second. But I just want to give you an example. I have here in Chrome a headings map plugin. You can get these for a number of browsers if you search for browser extensions. And if I click on this guy, I can see that I have here um, in this uh, page a, um, a, a way to access each of these sections. So I have here a nice you know, outline of my page uh, talking about building a lesson page, our basic considerations, our instructions. And you can see these little numbers here. Um, we have our, our heading level one is our page title, and then we have a two and three. And so our, our twos are our main topics and threes are kind of subtopics under that. And then we may also even go down to four if we have a sort of a sub subtopic. And the nice thing about this headings map is that with this, this little outline that I've got here, I can jump to different parts of my page um, to access them. You know, so just like skimming, um, the headings are really good for, for just about anybody to access the content. So I'm gonna close up this headings map and I'll show you how to add a heading. So when you're editing your text uh, with the little uh, edit text box, or even when you're creating it to start, uh, if you select a piece of text, there's this little menu uh, here called paragraph format. And it normally says normal uh, to start because normal text is sort of anything that's not a heading. Um, and when I go to a particular piece of text, I can select it. And then from the paragraph format, I can choose heading one, two, three, four, and uh, so on. Now, these will change the format of your text, but if you don't like that uh, size and shape of the font, you can select that and then change your font size uh, and, and whatnot to, to make it um, you know, smaller or bigger uh, as the case may be. And you do want to try to keep uh, the heading structure so that you know lower level headings are smaller than your your higher level ones. So here I have uh, heading two for structure, uh, and then headings under that um, is a heading level three. Um, and then our next section uh, we're going to talk about lists. So when you are um, making a list of items, uh, if you find yourself using a lot of commas to list things in a sentence, try using a bulleted list. Um, and to do this, you would select your text uh, or go to your text. And up here uh, in the editor is a little uh, insert remove bulleted list uh, button. It looks like two little dots with sort of lines of text after. And so you're gonna wanna select that text and um, insert uh, the bulleted list. So I'm just gonna click it to remove my bulleted list here. And you can see that um, there are these uh, separate lines of text. And then I just click that and now it's in a bulleted list. And screen readers will read this off. So they'll say, you know, list with two items, uh, item one, if you find yourself using more than three commas and so on. If possible, uh, avoid using lists with a uh, sub list uh, or, or sub bullets. Uh, try to break complicated lists into separate sections uh, with headings um, on the page. And similarly, there are numbered lists. Uh, and so this is also part of giving good instructions to students. Um, here we have a numbered list. Uh, again, up here in the editor, there's a little insert remove uh, numbered list button and it's just a one and a two uh, with the little lines after it. So if you're giving any instructions, rather than typing one period and the sentence, two period in the sentence, use this button because again, uh, for assistive technology, it's actually going to read to the students, this is a list with three items. So they have a heads up and they can jump uh, from item to item using um, their screen reader or um, keyboard commands. Uh, so here on the page, we have a numbered list uh, with the steps to, uh, in fact, number and bullet lists. <laughs> and you can find that on the page as well. Uh, I'm just going to cancel out of this so I don't make any changes uh, inadvertently. All right, we to move on to color. Yeah, let's go on to color. All right, because um, I want to get to images, I am going to kind of touch on color. Um, color 
anytime we talk about inclusive design, it doesn't mean that it can't be fun and exciting and you can't use your creative style. Uh, but we wanna make sure when you're choosing to use color, if you're going to change something, make sure you use high contrasting colors. And this is the contrast between the text color and the background color. Um, you can actually check your colors through a color contrast checker. And this is going to ask you for, and we are suggesting here WebAIM. Uh, this one actually is going to ask for the color code that you can find in Sakai. So if you go back to the UV website and go to the editor, and that's your pencil and paper uh, edit button. If you go and highlight your color, and right now Tiffany's highlighting high contrasting colors, and go to the text color button, you can go to the more colors and select that, then choose your color. And you can find then the color within the box that says selected color. And in this case, it's 990000. And this is known as a hex color. You don't really have to probably know that, but just know that you need that six uh, character code in order to put it into the color contrast checker. And then when you go back to WebAIM, you can paste that the foreground color is your text color. And then in Sakai right now, it, currently on default on this, the background is your white. And you can then see that the calculations are done in the background and for it goes through uh, the web content accessibility guidelines, both uh, A, AA and AAA, and you can see where it passes and doesn't. Uh, Tiffany, if you take the lightness and go towards uh, the lighter colors, you can see then when it drops off and when the colors actually start to fail the color contrast checker. So these are also great ways to talk about any kind of icons or normal text. So we do encourage you to use really good contrasting colors when you're um, working with your course content. And Another we have a, a question in the chat, Jen, yeah. uh, for what is considered large text? So on Thank the color you. contrast checker, um, we have normal text and large text and contrast actually uh, can be a little bit lower for larger text. Um, because uh, it's easier to see. So why don't you Thank you for tell asking us a little that. about that. Um, large text is technically 14 point bold or larger. So it's important to know that it's 14 point size and bold and larger. Anything 14 point and non-bold, even a 16 point non-bold would, would not be considered a, a large text. So you wanna make sure that once you hit the 14 point, you start bolding that color. Um, that's the idea in terms of what they work for. And there's a lot of conversions out there that you can see if you're working in, in pixels or anything else, but the point system is what is used in Word and Google Docs and in Sakai. So 14 point bold and higher would be a large text. And that's where you can find it in the size, font size uh, drop down, and then you can choose 14 and then make it bold and it's already bolded through the, the selection. So thank you for that question. Now color also, we wanna make sure that when you're choosing your content uh, during, even during the curation process, the examples that you are choosing, make sure it's not using color as the only source of information. Uh, the example that we have on here uh, is a document on the brain hierarchy. And I'm definitely not a biological scientist, so, in this case, you've got the brain uh, picture that has different portions of the brain in different colors. And below is the type, the, the uh, name of the part of the brain with all the parts that go uh, like the abstract thinking, problem solving, or is all part of the frontal lobe and balance and coordinations in the cerebellum. So the frontal lobe is, is in the front part and the cerebellum's in the, the bottom back, but they're only being shown by color with the heading. Now, if you had a, um, a color blindness, and in this case, uh, Tiffany has turned the entire sheet gray, you're not able to tell the difference between really the frontal lobe and the, fun or the functions. Maybe the cerebellum is a little bit hard to tell the difference between what else is in the middle of the brain. And this is really important that color isn't the only source of the information. Now to fix this, we would probably suggest then where this is actually how the, uh, the document was created. We removed all the labels. The brain has still the colors and enjoy, but they are also labeled in the brain section. 
And so it's not just the headings at the bottom of the sheet, it is the, the picture itself is labeled as well. So you're able to draw the connection textually from frontal lobe to the frontal lobe heading. So that's kind of making sure we don't use color as the only source of information. And knowing that we're getting down to our last 10 minutes, I do want to touch us on images. Uh, images are so important. They, they really kind of enhance your, uh, your engagement and they kind of build your emotional connections with your students for the topics and whatever the content is about. But we want to make sure that you kind of follow some, uh, some guidelines. Uh, to determine if you should use a photo or an image sometimes on your pages, ask yourself, what are the benefits of the image? I mean, are you just putting it on there to be funny? Are you just putting it on there to help the content? How is it supporting the content? Um, is it just there because you think it looks cool? Um, sometimes you don't need the image if the content supports it enough. Uh, does it help people understand the content on the page? That is where is it supplemental? What kind of information is this image providing? So keep that in mind. And what image is the message pre presenting? Is there a message at all? Things to ask yourself when you're choosing images for your content pages. A few don'ts that we want to uh, mention is don't use images of text it, um, unless it's absolutely needed. We do have an example of an image of text and this, uh, the accessibility is not a perk, is actually an image of text. This text would actually not be available to a screen reader user, as is unless it had an alternative text. And uh, if you select the edit button, again, with the pencil paper, and under the, the text field for alt text, we have added accessibility is not a perk with an exclamation point. This is actually providing an alter alternative means for that image of alt text. This doesn't always happen with um, alt text should probably be short and sweet, kind of like a really short tweet. Uh, if you're wanting to give somebody an assignment or maybe a pop quiz and you don't want it to be the, the questions to be copied, I've seen people uh, put them in an image of text so that way it can't be copied. Assistive technology is not able to read through that very well. And then even listening to a alt text with all the questions and all the answers can be very difficult experience. So we encourage you not to use images of text when possible. Um, also don't put an image without an alt text for a description. If you're going to have these, the images within your content, they're going to provide meaning. Make sure that meaning is available. And in a text alternative, it could be an image caption, this could be the image description, it could be the surrounding content on the page. Make sure that image has a proper text uh, alternative. One of the things I encourage you to do is when you have images on text, if you want to check around to see what's going on, take your hand, uh, take a piece of paper, turn off your screen, cover the image read the content around the image. Is there anything in that image that is only uh, being represented by the image? So in this case, we've discussed nothing about the tree growing out of the accessible ramp on our course content page. So that's going to be essential for adding an alt text because that image is then not going to be re represented to anybody in our surrounding content. So again, we'd go to the edit button and we would go to the alt text. Now, when you upload images, it'll tend to bring over the file name. That's not really a good alt text. So you really don't want it to be a file name. It could be image one, two, three. It could be a very long string of characters. Tiffany's currently typing in wheelchair ramp with tree growing out of it as the alt text. This is the short and sweet. This is what the image is. We're trying to just give you that here's an image of something that is blocking an accessible um, ramp. You can also provide an item description in this area. So we can add some extra information here. And you can adhere, uh, Tiffany's writing here is a ramp that would be accessible, uh, but the tree is growing into it. <laughs> um, So wheelchairs users can't, can't use, uh, use it. 
So in this case, you would say save. And now if we scroll down on our page, we have the image that has an alt text and that alt text is not visual, but we also have an item description that says here is a ramp that would be accessible, uh, but a tree is growing in it, so the wheelchair users can't use it. Uh, I also don't recommend making the alt text and the image item description the same. Make sure that they are different because they do have different purposes. So as we're going through, um, we have about five minutes left. Uh, we want to encourage you. So <clears throat> what we can, uh, we actually want to get, issue you a challenge uh, as you go through um, your, to your next course. We're getting towards the end of the semester. Maybe you're getting ready to build your uh, course for next uh, spring. We want to challenge you to think about what you will fix in your Sakai site today. Something you can go in and maybe it is videos with no captions. Maybe it is fixing your messy resources. Maybe there's lots of unused tools in your menu that you can go hide. Uh, maybe some poor link text you can update. Unclear instructions. Uh, maybe updating the page structure with headings and lists. Uh, increasing the color contrast. Or maybe there's uh, no text alternatives for your images. You can go in and add those. So we challenge you, pick one of these. Go out and give this a try in your Sakai instance. Tiffany, so want to add? We do have a question in the chat. Uh, can you use PDFs with screen readers? So that's something we had talked about earlier with finding good PDFs. Um, having a, a PDF where you um, select it and, uh, and it's properly marked up, uh, that's when you can use it with a screen reader. Um, PDFs were originally developed to, in fact, not be <laughs> readable uh, with different formats because it's called a portable document uh, format. So it was intended to sort of give you exactly what it looks like. But unfortunately, that's not very good for assistive technology if, in fact, it's not uh, readable um, by uh, tools like screen readers. Yes. Um, um, yeah. And then, sorry. We all had a different another question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we also had a, a question about adding uh, photos, uh, alt text. Uh, is it necessary to say picture is of? It actually is. You don't need to use picture is of in most cases. Um, and I I give you a, a slight caveat of um, screen readers will say image or graphic when it comes into a, a the file type of a picture. So you don't really need to say picture of, but if your content is an art, maybe you're an art uh, professor or teacher who is talking about maybe it's a watercolor and part of the content is to say, this is a watercolor who uses this type of style, you might then wanna mention that it is a watercolor. I've often suggested that sometimes telling people that it is a screenshot might be helpful. If it is providing extra information or that content or more of context, you can then choose the using something. Um, sometimes I will mention something as a headshot, but I usually am not suggesting saying picture of or photo of. Those tend to be generic enough that the assistive technology will already say that. Um, when you come across a picture, it will say picture or image, and then it'll read off the alt text or it'll read off the alt text graphic depending on the screen reader. Other questions or concerns? We have about one minute left before you guys can. Uh... Well, we wanna thank you for joining us in uh, this session. Uh, we know you have a lot of opportunities to choose, but please, we, we really need people to continue to create inclusive uh, course content for students so that way as many people as possible can have a very good and solid uh, experience for education. Is there a good oh. YouTube video that anyone uses to demonstrate a screen reader? Actually, one of the ones I like is not usually a YouTube, but it's actually in Microsoft. Um, when they talk, there is a video, 
on Microsoft doing meaningful links. So Jen, can you drop that uh, video yeah, link into finding um, right now? Maybe the get good content uh, mm -hmm. page. And uh, we also had a comment um, if we can share the uh, the plugins and such on the forums. So I will also add those to uh, the lesson pages. Uh, some information about that um, maybe on the. Um, on the build your lesson page, or I can add another sub page with um, information about uh, resources. Yes, I will uh, drop in the link and that'll be available to you in the next few minutes. Thanks for joining All us right. guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>